So we're going to be reading out of Luke chapter 8, but you should know this. And by the way, this is found in the sermon notes if you want to download it. Matthew 9, 18 through 26, Mark 5, 21 through 43, and Luke 8, 40 through 56. All three of these gospels record this, this encounter that Jesus had. Uh, it was actually Jairus. He, is, he had a daughter that was dying and he came to find Jesus. Now, what we see on the heel, this is on the heels of Jesus going across the sea, delivering a man uh, that was full of demons, now coming back, stepping onto his shore. And if you are a part of the Catholic faith, uh, one of the things they do is they name this part of the scriptures, St. Jude's Gospels. And here's what they mean by that. St. Jude, the patron, uh, patron saint of Jude, he's actually known for if you are in hopeless uh, cause, if you have a hopeless cause ahead of you, this is the saint that you're supposed to pray to. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to give commentary on, on, on what the Catholics teach, but I will say this. I encourage you to preach, to pray to Jesus, uh, Jesus alone. Let the Holy Spirit that's inside of you come alive. But, but this, this St. Jude, if you have a hopeless cause, how many have ever heard of a hospital by the name of St. Jude? The reason they were established is because they believed that there were hopeless causes that they needed to conquer and overcome. And so if I were to title today's sermon, it would be this. It would be hopeless causes. Okay. Is there any place in your life where you feel like there's a hopeless cause that you are facing? It could be a mental. It could be emotional. It could be a spiritual. It could be a physical thing that you're facing. I want to encourage you today to listen with open ears, and here's the point. By the way, I know some of you, you're not going to be listening the whole way through because I even get bored of me, but here's your, here's your thought. There's never a time that if you're in the middle of a hopeless cause, not to go to Jesus. He's always the one that you turn to in those places. And it may feel like in the middle of the battle, everybody else is getting heard but you. But delay is not denial. And I know that's not my original phrase, and I didn't come up with that, and who knows whoever did, but the fact is, it's true. Delay is not denial, but what if the delay, rather than being a denial, is in place so that when God comes through, there's no way you can ever deny him again? So let's just kind of get into this conversation. Luke chapter 8, if you have your Bibles, open them up with me. If you have the app, Feel free to pop open the notes, read along. When I say read along, don't do it out loud with me, just, just kind of with your eyes. So verse 40, it says, now, by the way, we're going to go from 40 to 56. So this is going to be a world's record for you reading this amount of scripture at one time, but I'm proud you're doing it with me. Now, when Jesus returned, returned from where? Healing the demon-possessed man. A crowd welcomed him, for they were expecting him. Why were they expecting him? They were probably standing on the side of the shore, watching his boat this entire time, going, I bet he comes back this way. Well, if he goes, we'll, we'll follow him. So everybody needed Jesus, wanted Jesus, were following him. And then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at his feet, pleading with him to come to his house. Why? Because his only daughter, a girl about 12, was dying. And when Jesus was on his way, the crowd almost crushed him. So let's just, let's pause. Let's set up this mental picture. Rather than just reading it, Jesus is walking along. A guy comes up and says, hey, will you hear my daughter? It's my only one. She's 12 years old. Jesus goes, sure, I'll go with you. So that, that is just like just the wrong picture that you have to be in your brain. How many have ever been to Disneyland before? Disneyland, Disney World, um, uh, Six Flags, Holiday World. At the end of the night, when everything, you're just leaving the happiest place on earth until around 1030, right? I have a picture of me with a double stroller and four kids asleep. I have other pictures. I have, I have vivid memories of trying to leave Disneyland as a herd. I don't, have you ever experienced this? You're moving as a herd and the only thing you hear is kids crying. I've never once been leaving Disneyland before. And by the way, you go once, how often have you been? I've been a lot. I'm a very privileged child. Leave me alone. Like we had a friend that worked there and we got in free every year. So I love, I love friends. So yeah. And I'm cheap. I don't know if I told you that. I've never paid full price for that place. So we're leaving and I've never once heard this, mom and dad, thank you for such a delightful day. I don't need one more thing. Yeah. Never heard. You know what I have heard? I've had Disney. I, I think they did this on accident. They line the exit with stores. 
with an ice cream and be big up blow. Who needs a who needs a twenty dollar balloon because it lights up and it has ears on it? But the kids need it and they want it. And if you've ever been in that environment before, with world crushing around you, Jesus is in the middle of that. And everybody who you think's going to an exit, they're going one direction to Jesus. Jesus is the exit. And so now you have this man, it was a head of a synagogue, but can we put it in today's words? This was the lead pastor of the biggest church in the area. Okay, so pretty well known. He had his own radio ministry, podcast, TV ministry. You always got flyers at Christmas and Easter inviting you to come back to the temple. Like they were really good at marketing. People knew who this guy's face was. And this guy, he would have been in a very interesting kind of spot in his life because for his entire life, he's been on the pulpit. He's been on the stage preaching about this God and he's preaching about this God and he's having you do all these animal sacrifices. But this religion has become very stale, very routine. But now there's another guy named Jesus that has just shown up talking about the exact same God, but there's a little difference. Rather than you saying, hey, bring your tithes and offerings, bring your animals, we'll sacrifice them once a year, come and do these festivals. This guy named Jesus is physically walking on water, talking about the same God. He's taking fish and loaves and he's multiplying them. He's not having to ask people to bring a potluck meal to feed the, the widows whose husband just died. Like he's just making the food out of nowhere. He's healing people with leprosy, blind eyes, deaf ears. And you are in a very like juxtaposition of, hang on, I think we're talking about the same God, but his God seems to be very alive and active. And my God seems to be just still killing animals, right? right? Like this is, this is where he's at right now. And then something happens. And, and by the way, some of this is conjecture, but I'm sure it was happening. Then all of a sudden, this, this rabbi, this priest, this, this head of the synagogue gets called to this private meeting and there's all these other Pharisees and Sadducees and all these people around the table and they're going, man, we got to get rid of this man named Jesus. Well, why? Well, he's throwing off our religion altogether. And this guy's, yeah, we got to get rid of him. He's, he's, he's going to mess up our money. Do you guys remember the first time we were at the temple, he came in and threw over all the, all the tables and started kicking out all our vendors, which by the way, we get a kickback on all the, oh, I know. I remember when he did that. My cousin, Larry, I just couldn't believe he did that to him, right? And so, so now all of a sudden, this guy is probably a part of a group wanting to get rid of Jesus. But something has happened in his life. Life has brought him a situation where every other answer has come up void, but there could be one solution that he reaches out to. So now he has to put what I know versus what I believe. And I believe this about God and I believe this about my faith, but I know this. I know that I've heard other people give testimonies. I've heard of other people come into church on a Sunday morning and raise their hands. I've heard of other people who said they'd never clap during worship, now raise their hand during worship. I've heard other people say the marriage was, uh, it, it was falling apart. It was absolutely useless. There's no way to work on it. But now they have children and they run the marriage program at the church. I've heard of people who were broke that went through a financial peace and now they're heading up and they're debt free. I've heard, I've heard, I've heard, I've heard. And what do I do when the thing that I cherish most is being stripped away from from me. And so this, uh, this, um, uh, this, this dad makes his way through this crowd that's pressing in on him. And in the, uh, and you see this through the other gospels, he drops in front of Jesus and he says, I need you to heal my 12 year old daughter. She's dying. And by the way, the word here dying is actually she is already breathing her last breaths. It isn't she's sick and no one can make her better. It is she's at the end times. The, if you ever had these uh, uh, biblical scholars out there saying we're at the phrase the end time, there's one big fancy word they use. That's the word that's being used here. And Jesus goes, yeah, I'll go with you. And this had to be shocking for everybody who was around him because this is a rabbi now bowing in front of Jesus who he's supposed to be in opposition against. And rather than Jesus going, hey, aren't you against me? Haven't you always denied me? You don't believe in me? Ha ha, I get to stick it to you now. That's human response. 
But the Christ response is to say, I don't care what brought you to this place and the life that you lived before now, but if you are interested in touching me here in this place, I will go with you. So now, may your anointing sweep across this place. So now, you got to picture this, Jairus. I mean, how, how would you go through this crowd? I'm thinking you would channel your inner linebacker, right? Arms out, move, come through. How many have ever seen Princess Bride with Andre the Giant? That, that's the picture that I get to, everybody move. And like you're trying to move people across, move people across. And next thing you know, like Jesus this way, just a little bit further, just a little bit further. And all of a sudden he looks back and there is no Jesus, just a crowd. Because something happens here. Verse 43, a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him, him being Jesus, and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter, Peter Peter's my favorite, you got to love this. Hey, master, the, the people and the crowding and the, the pressing, you just want to know who touched you? 870 people just touched you, Jesus. Like, no offense, you may be sleep deprived. We, what's, what's going on with what you're saying? And Jesus goes, no, 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 someone touched me, and I know this. Why? Because power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet in the presence of all the people. She told him why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Okay, let's just pause again. You got Jairus. He's making his way through the crowd, moving everybody the way. Jesus, we're on a time crunch. We have to get you there. I've come to you, and we cannot delay anymore. We can't delay anymore. My daughter is on her deathbed at any point, breathing her last breath, and I have to get you Jesus you know, oh, Jesus, like, where are you, right? But Jesus paused all of a sudden because someone touched him. What do you mean that someone touched him? So every, I'm going to have you say this word. Say talit. Okay, have you ever seen a Jewish man with a long kind of piece of fabric around his neck? So that is his talit. And here's what the Jewish tradition would do at this time. They would take this prayer cloth is what it is, and they would flip it up over their head. And if you could picture this, they made a little temple, a little tabernacle, a little tent. And this would be their prayer tent that they would pray inside of. And it was kind of a remembrance of what Moses did years and years and years ago and what David did in his tabernacles years and years and years ago. So these Jewish men would pick up this talit and they would put it over their head and this is where they would pray. And if you could say this, this was their mini church that they tabernacled with God. And Jesus would have had this talit around him. And when it said that she touched his, his, his clothes, that word there is actually twisted coils, which means she reached into his prayer tent to pull something out of it. She didn't go for his sandals. She didn't go for his robe. She didn't go to touch his sleeves or his wrist. She went into the very place of prayer that she knew that he would have been tabernacling with God all the time because she wasn't reaching to the man, Jesus. She was reaching to the God that he tabernacled with. And by the way, this happens today, and you know this happens today. Something big happens in your life. What's the first thing you do? Flip up your talit and go to prayer? Or do you call the church, call the pastors, call your nav group and reach into someone else's prayer cloth? Do you say, hey, I need prayer for this. You need to join along with me. I love when I join along with people, but most of the times when I get prayer requests, I feel like what I'm being asked is, will you pray for me? And I could be dead wrong on that. And if I did, I'm not trying to offend. I'm trying to challenge. We have to have our own talit. And I love when people want to reach into mine because I believe sometimes people also reach into the pastors, reach into the elders and the deacons in your nav group and stuff like this because you know there are those of us that actually tabernacle with God that believe that when we pray, he hears. And not only that, we still believe in the miraculous healing power of Jesus Christ. 
This isn't something that when Jesus died, by the way, sensationalism, if you want the fancy word on this, that when Jesus died, the Holy Spirit is done and we can't have miracles on working on the earth today. I still believe the miracle working power of Jesus Christ, the delivering power of Jesus Christ, the tongue talking, water walking power of Jesus Christ is still present for us here today. But do you have that in your own prayer tent or do you have to reach to someone else's? But Jesus was so in tune. And by the way, if you want to know more about prayer, go on our website. I did a series a while back called The Five Ps. And on one of them, uh, it was your practical discipline, prayer being one of the three practical disciplines that you need to do. Here's how I would say it. Jesus in his toolbox of miscellaneous things had enough that he was able to pour out. But when it was taken, he stopped and said, wait, something has just been pulled from me. Who was it? wasn't me it wasn't me it wasn't me why if this why if she got healed wouldn't she have stepped up right away and said Jesus that was me thank you very much well it was because she goes on and again you see more of this context in the parallel passages that I've already mentioned that she had had an issue of blood for 12 years for 12 years, she's been warring with this thing happening in her body. And so I'm going to take a moment to read out of one of the favorite books of the Bible, Leviticus. No one wants to say amen on that one? Okay, okay. Page turner, absolutely. Here's what it is. It's a list of rules. But in this list of rules, and, and I'll talk more about it after I read this, this woman would have been keenly aware of what was happening right now. In Leviticus 15, the whole chapter is great. You should go read it on your own. It says, when a woman, verse 25, has a discharge of blood for many days at a time other than her monthly period, or has a discharge that continues beyond her period, she will be unclean as long as she has the discharge just as the days of her period. Any bed that she lies on while her discharge continued, that bed is unclean. As, as her bed during her monthly period, as anything she sits on, that's unclean. Anything she wears, anything she touches during this period of time, anyone who touches them will be unclean. They must wash their clothes and bathe in water and they will be unclean until that evening. So for 12 years, she's labeled as unclean. Now, you may just say, okay, she had a discharge of blood, she's unclean. No, no, no. This label of unclean is so unhealthy to a Jewish person during this time, which means as far as having community, she could not have had community. She's put on the outs, the same way with someone with leprosy. You just Now, during that monthly period, you're separated, and right now you're sitting there going, this is the God that I study and I believe and I trust. Hang on. These are Old Testament ritual laws that point us to something else. So at this time, husbands, you don't have to make your wife sleep on the couch, okay? Just, uh, that's all I'll say there. But, but during this time, this was a way to keep the community healthy as well as be a visual demonstration that there's times in our life that we are unclean. And so for 12 years now, not only has she not been able to have community, when it comes to the yearly rituals of going to temple and worshiping God and doing sacrifices, she can't do any of those things. If she had a husband, he would not have been able to physically touch her for 12 years. Can I just go on record? And your marriage may be here right now. If you've gone 12 years without touching your spouse, you may be in an unhealthy marriage. I don't even have to prophesy that. That's just, just you know, that's just logical at this point. And so now she hasn't had the touch of a man. If she didn't have a man, she had no way to find a man and be intimate with him. She's been on the outs as far as her faith. She's been on the outs as far as community. And it also tells us that she has spent all her money going to every single doctor trying to get help. So at this point, this girl is flat broke. And so when it says that Jesus turned around and said, who did this to me? The reason she didn't step up and said, hi, it was me. Because this, you remember this crowd that we were talking about? This crowd that she was pushing through? Every single person that she would have been in contact with at this moment would have been labeled unclean for what she did. But when Jesus turned and said, who did this to me? She sat there and said, it was me. But at this point, Jesus, I was hopeless. I was hopeless, and the only thing that I could do was to try to get close to you, and I know that the community's probably going to be mad at me, and there's people that are going to judge me, but when I had nothing else to do but run after, chase after, dive after you, and reach into your prayer closet and pull it off, everybody else at this time, in my mind, the crowd is moving back. 
Don't touch her. We'll be unclean. We have to do sacrifices. We have to, we have to do ritualistic cleanings. Like everybody else is moving back. And this is the point where she broke faith traditions to find Jesus and everybody else was offended by it. This is where we see our Jesus moving closer to her. In this place where everybody else is outing you, ostracizing you, Jesus is drawing close to you. So let me ask you this. What place in your life do you struggle with that you believe makes you unclean? What place in your life do you war with on a regular basis that you feel puts you on the outs with Jesus? And is that thing the thing that should be putting you on the outs with Jesus, ostracizing you from Jesus, moving you farther from Jesus, or should that be the actual fuel that moves us towards him? And I think it depends on your belief on how he will respond. Oh, honey, look at all the people that are filthy because of you. He, he didn't say that. He didn't say, oh, you didn't ask to get into the prayer line so that we could have a catcher behind you with a modesty cloth so that I could lay hands, do a prayer to see if God comes through. Now, he didn't say that. He looks down at her having hear this or in, uh, that she was instantly healed. In verse 48, then Jesus said to her daughter, what a powerful word right there. One who's a part of the family. You don't have to go through classes. You don't have to jump through hoops. I'm immediately identifying you as daughter. Your faith has healed you. Not my talit, not my prayer cloth, not my time with God, not a religious circumstance. The thing inside of you that you knew that if you could push hard enough, reach far enough, and grab firm enough, you could be able to get a hold of the healing power of Jesus Christ. If you are finding, we're just, Lord, we pray for the clapping anointing to either take off or don't because it's throwing me out of my rhythm, God. And one person claps right then. That's, that's, that's comedy gold right there. I, I love that. I think the thing that blows me away the most of this story is that this lady had any hope whatsoever. Twelve years. Hope is easily stolen from us. I want, to, I want to share this with my family today. My, my eldest brother has received horrible news from the doctor of it's not a potential life-threatening thing. It's a life-threatening thing. Three to five years is the average. Some people have lived way beyond that. Three, five years is the average. And this is one of those diseases there is no treatment for. And he does not know Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. I look at this as a hopeless situation. We're not with him all the time. He's not going to church. There are, there's no evangelist knocking on his door. But if I lose hope, how could there ever be hope for? If the enemy can steal your hope that there's a better day coming, then you have no, you won't even consider reaching out to the prayer cloth of our Savior. God, I just pray right now. This is not the end of the sermon for those that are getting excited about that. I pray for anyone who is hopeless right now. You've been struggling through your life and your scenarios and the different worlds that you interact with. And when it comes to who you are right now, I, I just right now, there's someone that you are struggling with depression and you haven't been able to get over it. It hasn't gotten any better for you. And you are finding hopelessness in this. I just pray for you right now. And I say, hope come alive. 
I believe there's even people, it's someone here that the only thing you've been turning to lately is cutting. And I just say right now that there's hope in Jesus Christ and you don't have to have superficial wounds to demonstrate an internal pain that you're going through. And even right now that is being broken off of your life. I pray for some of you that have had chronic joint and back pains and you've given up on doctors, chiropractors and medicine. I just say right now, don't let hope die in your life. Reach one more time, push through the crowd one more time, and grab the hem of his garment. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So now you have this woman in this beautiful moment on the ground. I don't know how you would be, but I would be in tears because she knew immediately a healing had taken place 12 years and it's gone. And Jesus saying, hey, go in peace, you're healed. So then other people like, are we dirty then? Like, how does this affect us? And Jesus is like, come here, daughter. And, and I, you got to think he just scooped her up and embraced her and her head buried into his shoulder, weeping and crying. And there's a little disturbance behind because there's someone that had Jesus helping him to heal a daughter, but now a different daughter just got healed. And, and in my movie, in my picture, this is the moment where she moves away from Jesus and over her shoulder, she catches eyes with Jairus. This was the priest that she's talked to for 12 years that couldn't do anything. This was the priest that had her on the prayer on the prayer app so that everybody could be praying for her. This is the priest that would bring food over to her house and drop it on the front door so that she could eat occasionally. This is the priest that she called late at night and said, I'm ready to give up, I'm suicidal. And he talked her into living one more day. And this is the priest now looking at the miracle that he needed. Hey, Jairus. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus and said, your daughter's dead. Let's not bother the teacher anymore. So where the rest, see if you don't find this in yourself, the rest of the world is celebrating the success of their Savior. You are being crushed in that very moment. You're isolated despite being found in a multitude of people. You're angry, but you're so wounded you can't scream. You need to run home and embrace your daughter because according to the Jewish law, death has occurred and there's only a few people being the dad, one of them, that could actually touch her. And we need to start moving towards the burial because her body will start decaying immediately. But you can't run to her because you're just frozen in pain. Jesus hearing this. How in the world did he hear this? You think this guy came up, Jairus, hey, she's dead. Didn't make it. There's no way. This guy came up and was ready for this man to collapse in his arm and said, I am sorry to tell you this, but your daughter is dead. But when we don't think that God can hear anything, his ear is attuned to us in a powerful way to say this is the moment. This is the moment that things switched. Why? Because delay is not denial. If someone feels led by the Holy Spirit to bring me a tissue, I will allow you to move out in that anointing right now because things are just getting dirty up here. <laughs> Hearing this, Jesus said, don't be afraid. Just believe that she is healed. Thank you, sir. You're a scholar and a gentleman and a country worship leader. <laughs> he with the mic makes the last comment. So that's what Proverbs says. Proverbs 32. Proverbs keep talking so no one else can hear him. Okay. Don't be afraid, just believe and she'll be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he, he being Jesus, did not let anyone go in with him except for Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. So I will tell you this. Let me just pause here. 
give you something that isn't in the scripture, but I believe this is what happened because this is what needs to occur in our life. When Jairus first came to Jesus and said, my daughter's sick, 12 years, can you come heal her? Jesus said, yes. Jairus is moving through the crowd, trying to block for Jesus as he's following in behind him. And all of a sudden, Jesus stopped, began healing someone else. Now, Jairus gets to the place of he is desperate because she is dead, but he thinks he's been denied. But the problem was, I don't think there was a denial just to prove only the power of Jesus Christ. I think the denial needed to pause because at this point, Jairus was leading the way to the house where we need to get to the point where Jesus leads the way to the house. Jesus, come with me. I'm going to tell you what you need to do for my life in this moment. And Jesus is like, well, your moment must not be bad enough yet. If you can still be upright talking to me, you're not in enough place of desperation. Give me a second. I'm going to show off over here for a minute. Now you got to think Jairus is going, why are we still going to the house? Why is he coming with us? And a servant throws his arm around this, this fellow brother, sister, whoever it might be, throws Jairus' arm around and goes, listen, if he's going, we have to go with him. Are you in a place where you're leading your relationship with Jesus or is Jesus leading your relationship with him? So Jairus, I'm just thinking, tears have to be flowing. Because here's the thing, even if you know God's going to come through, we still live in the moment. We can't be present in the future. Oh, he's going to do something. He's going to do something. Take away my pain. Isn't that what we do when we, when we tell Jesus this is what we need and we don't think he will do it for us? We actually give him lesser prayer requests. God, bring about a massive miracle, but give us grace as we walk through this. Well, you want the grace or you want the miracle? That's duplicity, and I mean, they, which one are you asking for? We're going to stand for the miracle at this point, and God, we're going through it with you. That, that sounds like a better prayer to me. So now Jesus, to get everybody out of here, he takes up Peter, James, John, and the father's mother and child. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing, mourning for her, and Jesus said, shut up. They translated that wrong. Here's why I say translated long. Remember a while back we talked about Jesus coming over to the temple, flipping over the, ta the tables? The same words are used here. He showed up to this house and he started flipping over their tables. Because if you've asked me to come in the house, I'm going to disrupt the way you think you need to do life. So these paid whalers at this point, this is what they were. They were paid to come into the house in order to mourn. And the more, the richer you were, the more people you could afford. But yet at the same time, again, according to Jewish laws, these people would be unclean because they were too close to a dead body, but they didn't care. You know why? They were getting paid. Now Jesus showed up and goes, you're fired. This, this is a big deal. Like this is their income. And he goes, you guys need to stop. She's not dead. He's, she's asleep. And they laughed at him, which I would have too. The chest hasn't been going up and down for four hours. She's dead. There's certain things that human body does upon death. She's done those. She is not sleeping. And they laughed at him because they knew that she was dead. But Jesus took her by the hand. And said, child, get up. Her spirit returned. She was dead. Her spirit returned. It didn't say her breath returned. It didn't say her heartbeat returned. The spirit that occupied her body was vacant from her, and he reached into the eternal. There is something about right now of finding out what we need to do to reach into the eternal, the unseen place, the prayer cloths, the, the talits, the twisted coils, the unseen realm, and pull into, out of heaven, into earth. It almost sounds like a prayer that was taught to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be my name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Where? On earth, as it is in I knew you guys knew that prayer. I'm so proud of you right now. It would have been awkward if like four of you, it would have been the clapping anointing and the Lord's prayer anointing all in the same place, same day. So her spirit returned and at once she stood up. And this is why, if you want to know one of the reasons I believe that the Bible is authentic, it is not made up. There's a couple things. 
as far as the, uh, the timeline in which it was written and which it was copied is, is, is better than any other ancient document in the history of the world. When it comes to the proof of uh, oral tradition as well as what um, uh, non-engineers, the, the people who sweep dirt and, and architects, not architects, archaeologists, I knew I was close. I was, it, like what they have un unearthed and what we find in the scriptures always seem to match. But one of the reasons why I believe the Bible is accurate and real is because of this sentence right here. This seems so small to you. Then Jesus told them, give her something to eat. Why would you put that up in there if you were making up a story? How insignificant is that fact that Jesus told them to give her something to eat until you start thinking, wait a second, if she's been sick for a few days, when's the last time you were sick for a week and decided to have a cheeseburger? You stop eating. You're dehydrated. You have malnutrition going on. And Jesus, when he steps in to heal you, he wants to heal all of you. And not only does he want to heal you in that moment, he wants to feed you with the fuel you need to move into the destiny that he just created for you. So Jesus, in the most practical way, get up, daughter. Hi, it's good to see you. Oh, I hear that belly tum rumbling. Can we get her some food? Because I bet it's been a week, two weeks, three weeks since she's had anything of value in her stomach. And her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Jesus is, when it comes to being a PR agent, Jesus is one of the worst in the world. Demon-possessed man wants to get in and learn more. Nope. You don't need any more. Yeah, he really did. Nope, not according to Jesus. Hey, I just brought someone back to death. Could you do me a favor? Just don't tell anyone about this. This is no big deal. At this point, there's no way Jairus went back to living life as normal. Because, and I hope you hear this with the love and grace that I'm trying to intend it with, Jesus allowed him to go to the depths of his pain in order to heal him to the highest of the next uh, New Day gains. We sit sometimes and we just think, God, you're denying us, you're denying this, you're denying us. And maybe one of the reasons is because we're trying to lead Jesus versus follow Jesus. But I would say this, there could be a chance that if God came through now, there would still be ways that we would naturally be able to justify it. Versus Jesus going, I'm going to get to the point where you can't deny it. But in that denial, do you think Jairus the next day went back to the temple and said, hey, we got to get back to life as normal? Or do you think he was one that went back and said, this Jesus ain't as bad as you think he is? And hang on a second, hang on a second. I, I know you guys are saying this, but I heard Jesus preach it like this one time. And how do you know that? Because I've been following him now. I believe Jairus' life was forever altered because of this situation that he just went through. And so in your dark place, in your desperation, in your pain, in your misery, my prayer is simply this for you. I pray that you find a Jesus that you wouldn't find any other way than someone whispering in your ear going, it is too late. But I'm here to tell you now, when it comes to Jesus, there's no such thing as a hopeless cause. You are not a hopeless cause. Your family is not a hopeless cause. The work environment that you're living in is not a hopeless cause. The court case that you're facing is not a hopeless cause. The bankruptcies that's still on your, um, uh, on your record is not a hopeless cause. The felony that you're facing or have is not a hopeless cause. The disease that you have is not a hopeless cause. You are not a hopeless cause as long as you don't let hope die. So today, God... We reach with hope for that which we need. I just pray for anyone that you feel like you are in a denial process right now. I pray that you change that and realize I'm just in a delay process.
that your prayer becomes Jesus, even though this is delayed, move me to the point where I can never deny you anymore. For those of us that are trying to lead our relationship with Jesus versus following the lead of Jesus, God, I pray that that order shifts immediately. That in our life, it's not about knowing everything about you. It's not about having all the answers about you. But God, it is about following you into the future that is beckoning us. I once again just pray for anyone who is hopeless right now. That you even said, I can't cry anymore because it does no good. I pray for hope to begin to arise. If you have your eyes closed, can I just encourage you to keep them closed for two more minutes? I would hate to end this day by not at least saying this. If there's anybody in here right now, your hope for the future is unknown because you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to tell you today that hope can be found in an eternal God that died for you. You've probably heard this sometime around Easter or at least aware of it because of Christmas. Emmanuel, God with us. God stepped out of heaven to walk on earth, clothe himself in flesh, to live with mankind for 33 and a half years. And during that time period, he walked a life that was perfect. Why was this important? Because there was a day that he was going to be hung on a cross. And out of her, his perfection, he covered all of our imperfections. So does that mean if you receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, there will be a day that you end up in heaven? Absolutely, without a doubt, yes. But I would say I don't want to focus on the retirement package. Right here, right now, here on earth, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, God the Father, can be present with you when you have a personal relationship with Him. The struggles that you're facing, the blood that is pouring out, the death that is around you, Jesus can be present in all of those things. So if you're here right now and you don't know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, if you're a part of our online community and this question is for you, with all eyes closed, no one's looking, if you're here today and you're ready to say yes to Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, could I just ask you to slide your hand in the air just so that I can see that you've made that decision? And as people are making decisions here inside the church, I'm going to also speak to those in our online campus. If that's you right now, rather than just raising your hand, could you do me a favor? There may be a like button that's popping up in front of you, a comment showing up that you can hit the like comment there. Can I say this? That's your digital hand raise. Scriptures tell us that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, so if you raise your hand, I believe you believe in your heart. But can we all confess with our mouth right now this, this here? Say, dear Jesus, I believe that there will be a day that I breathe my final breath. And the only way to have eternal life is to believe in you. So I believe in you. Forgive me of my sins. Become Lord of my life. And here on earth, I choose to follow you. God, I thank you for every hand that was raised, every mouth that declared, every heart that believed. And today we celebrate. We celebrate with those decisions. Now, God, may your spirit rest with all of those in a place of hopelessness. Those that feel like you're bleeding out and there's nowhere else to reach, reach one more time. Those of you that need to understand this, the power of Jesus by reaching into his tabernacle, I pray for your prayer life to increase this day. But for those who have been feeling like your denial means a, de a death, I pray the death just causes you to never be able to deny who Jesus is. Thank you for today, God. Amen, amen.